Anyway, we tried to avoid that and to do it well. We being basically Cornelia Zwischenberger, who's one of the project-funded doctoral students, uh, she was in charge of the survey research. Uh, instead of, um, as other people like this master's student and even Chiaro Nocella did, changing some of the criteria, we made sure we kept the same criteria, the same wording for the criteria to ensure comparability and added two criteria that emerged as relevant in, in the research that had been done since the mid-1980s. We kept the four-point rating scale rather than using the ranking scale to ensure that the task didn't interfere with the findings. <clears throat> we also kept AIC members as the target population because I didn't mention that the 1,000 invitations that were sent out by Chiaro and Nocella were sent out, as they say, to different interpreter organizations or associations. And I asked them many times, which ones, where? And it's impossible to establish which associations received the invitation to participate in that survey, which I think, in terms of replication, is a big problem because we don't know what population exactly was accessed, whether these were all conference interpreters or whether there were court interpreters or all-purpose interpreters. In some countries, people do all kinds of interpreting work. And if you think of the criterion of completeness, for instance, um, it could make a difference, whether you work in the legal setting or in a conference setting. And uh, that's another example of something to be avoided in a replication. So we stuck with AIC members, but we were inspired by the web-based approach taken by Chiaro Nocella and did it on the web. So for those of you who um, are interested also in survey research and using the web to administer a questionnaire, I'll briefly um, say that the tool that we used is called Lime Survey. It's an open source uh, software using uh, these programming languages that I don't need to get, go into detail. It's all open source and it's multilingual. It's uh, very well developed by the open source community and it's available, I'm sure, in, in Portuguese and in Japanese and Chinese. So in terms of uh, sharing work and doing it on a multinational basis, it's a very nice tool and consists, as all of these tools do, of uh, a questionnaire generator that where you compose the questions. It's very user-friendly to put the questions in and choose various response categories. And then when you administer it, it has two databases. Uh, a ba database of email addresses, so you need to have a list of email addresses of your target population members. and the responses are then collected in a database and obviously the two are completely separated and that ensures, automatically ensures um, anonymity of responses. So you can, when you administer the survey, you can check whether a response has come in from a certain email address, but you cannot trace the response to the, res uh, to the database. You can only say, ha, the person number 19 in Poland has responded, responded uh, but you, you don't know which response comes from whom. But what's elegant about it is when you do a reminder, when you send a reminder, the reminder will only be generated, of course, for those people who haven't sent the response. I don't know about you, but I get increasingly annoyed when I get an invitation to participate in a survey and I get every reminder, even though I've responded, and this uh, tool avoids that easily. The reminders are only sent to people who haven't responded, obviously. Anyway, uh, this is the survey entry page that was created for the AIC members. Uh, more than 2,500 invitations by email were sent out to AIC members, everybody with a functioning email address. Some chose not to have it published, so out of the 2,800 2, members, we were able to access the population of more than 2,500 uh, AIC members. And here, for instance, we see that we did want to go beyond the approach by Bühler and definitely wanted to collect background data. 
employment status in terms of are you freelance interpreter or are you a staff interpreter with an institution, uh, which region do you work in, AICIS has different regions, and the age, gender, and the language combination and so forth. So background variables were part one. Part B was this online version of the Bühler questionnaire. You see it hasn't changed that much. Uh, the same rating task, except that instead of saying irrelevant, we said unimportant, to keep uh, the wording from very important, important, less important, unimportant, rather than calling it irrelevant. Uh, but other than that, we, we kept them, and we added the criterion of synchronicity, because that came up in user expectation research done in the 1990s, also commissioned by AIC, where some users said they wanted to have as much synchronicity as possible in the simultaneous interpretation between the original and the interpretation. So we added that and we added intonation based on all the interesting work that Angela Collados had been doing since the late 1990s. Um, the findings, uh, 700, more than 700 respondents with an average age of 52 years. The typical distribution, it's a very female profession and only a quarter of respondents men, so this perfectly matches the full population with a lot of experience, 24 years of working experience on average. So AIC members are a very experienced group and uh, they're really a good population to ask about interpreting related issues. They're not new on the job exactly and the typical distribution, about 10% staff and the rest freelance interpreters. This is the image of findings uh, in terms of the order of priorities for the first eight or nine criteria that was made famous by the studies by Kurtz. Not that different. I mean, you couldn't Im grasp the immediate order of preferences, but again, sense consistency, logical cohesion, fluency. If we look at the bottom, pleasant voice, native accent, those are usually bringing up the rear. So uh, it's easier than to compare the list. First of all, a comparison between Chiaro and Nocella's replication or so-called replication of the Bühler study and our IEEC survey, where we have this discrepancy between completeness being very important and completeness not being among the top criteria. If we compare our AIC survey with the original AIC member survey by Bühler, we're talking about 700 respondents versus 47 respondents. We find an, a very impressive degree of correspondence. There's only one slight change here in the relative importance of terminology versus fluency of delivery, but on the whole, the order of priorities that Bühler managed to establish in her small-scale study was impressively corroborated in this full population survey. Uh, I didn't mention that so far, but I said that we really sent out invitations to all the AIC members with a functioning email address, which means that we, we avoided the issue of sampling. Uh, it's a lot of work to process 700 responses because we also had uh, other parts to the survey and open-ended questions uh, and Connie Zwischenberger really spent about a year processing the findings so it, we could have said let's just do a sample then we don't have that much work but then we get into issues of sampling, right? Should we just have let's say 20% of the membership or does it matter the age groups, the regions, then we would have to design a stratified sample and it gets very complicated. So we just said uh, we give everybody a chance to participate in the survey and then we ensure that this is as representative as possible. So much for the findings. Uh, this is the extended list with the additional criteria of uh, lively intonation and pleasant voice. As you can see, now you can see, the pointer, um, they are not considered very important. Intonation and voice are close to the lower end. But again, we have a very clear um, scale and line of priorities. It's a very clear picture of relative importance, I think. Uh, style, intonation, not among the top
priorities. Now, here's another innovation. One innovation in that replication study was to use web-based surveying, doing it well, accessing the full population rather than just a, a small group of people. And the other thing uh, is something that came up in research where people said, or, or Daniel Gilles was among the pioneers saying that there are different types of assignments, there are different types of conferences, and so maybe we shouldn't be so sure that uh, the same priorities apply to all different kinds of assignment. Even Jean Herbert in his handbook in 1952 said that explicitly, and I, I failed to give you that quote here, where he said, obviously when you work in a major diplomatic conference, then you will be more attentive to issues of style and wording, whereas when you work for uh, a technical conference, you might focus on terminological correctness. So Jean Herbert in 1952 wrote that, and by saying that as Bühler did and as we did in the survey, these are the quality criteria. We are really ignoring the finding that the world of interpreting is more complex than just interpreting, simultaneous interpreting. So we wanted to take that into account. First gave the rating task and the next question was, okay, now we've established a priority of criteria, but does the importance of those criteria that you've just rated depend on the type of meeting. And we gave some examples, for instance, a seminar type, a negotiation, a press conference, a large uh, institutional assembly. And to those, for those respondents who were careless enough to answer yes, <laughs> uh, we offered an open-ended uh, box to saying, if so, please indicate what the, the difference, the change might be. And uh, luckily, many actually uh, said there might be a difference and took the trouble to fill in their responses and gave us a lot of uh, information. And I can, if there is time, I can briefly look at these variations in context. Is there time? Time exists. Time exists. How much more time, roughly, should so we plan? Ten, ten minutes. Ten minutes? Yeah, fine. So briefly. Uh, we have established that there is a pretty fixed, a pretty stable order of priorities, but still they might change depending on the context and the assignment. And uh, actually it was a, a split response, about 40% saying yes, they do vary by type of assignment, and about 40% saying no, these criteria stay the same. It's a difficult finding. What do we teach our students? <laughs> should they adapt to the type of meeting or should they assume that sense consistency and logical cohesion and fluency is always in the same kind of relative order? Anyway, uh, this is a look at the type of uh, things that might vary. For instance, in a technical conference, uh, correct terminology and completeness would be more important, moving up in the list as it were, whereas style and intonation might move down in the list of priorities. And the other thing that many people commented on spontaneously was in the case of media events or press conferences, their synchronicity might be much more important than is reflected in the rating, in the overall rating, and pleasant voice because it might be in a media setting whereas completeness and correct terminology might be less important or even irrelevant. And that again matches the Kurtz's findings for the media setting. Apparently there are some rules applying to media interpreting that are not the same as interpreting in international conference settings. And for seminar type of meetings, correct terminology and lively intonation were mentioned as something to be uh, looking out for, whereas stylistic and grammatical issues might be less important in these issues. So these were the, this is a processing of the open-ended responses to this innovative question, we feel, that we took seriously that these criteria might vary depending on the type of assignment. Another kind of extension, not only by context, would be by national uh, uh, context. Um, 
because the AIC population is a very special population. The most experienced, the high level established interpreters. Um, and there are some countries that have very few AIC members but still have sizable populations of conference interpreters. Um, so the idea was that we could treat AIC members not as fully representing the profession of conference interpreting but as only representing one segment of the profession. And so another idea of replication would be to extend that population beyond the AIC membership in a given national context. And we did so with Germany. Connie Zwischenberger did that too on her own. And we did uh, a study in Poland and in the Czech Republic, uh, translating the questionnaires into Polish and into Czech and distributing it again on a web-based um, approach in these countries. The, that was done in the context of master's thesis and uh, only one has finished so far, but uh, roughly speaking, the results are largely, largely comparable, but I, I, don't, uh, I can't show you any, any findings here for the Czech and Polish surveys. Spain is on the agenda, but hasn't been done yet. Anyway, I can show you the results for Germany to answer the claim whether different national markets and language backgrounds, different type of membership, might have an impact on the interpreter's list of priorities in terms of what is a good simultaneous interpretation. Uh, just again, if we make a comparison of the list of priorities, again, we should also look at the background variables because they might shape the findings. And here it's interesting that the two populations are different in interesting ways whereas we have an average age of 52 years in the AIC group, we have an average age of 40 years in the German Conference Interpreter Association group. So we have a younger population. Uh, the same thing with working experience, 24 years on average in AIC and 12 years of working experience in the German Association of Conference Interpreters, VKD. So again, the background variables uh, might shape the results. Gender, again, that's not that important, but this is the list of findings. And it doesn't look all that different. I'll show you the, the list later on. There is a high degree of comparability also for the 107 respondents, who, people who responded to the German language questionnaire on quality criteria in conference interpreting. And that, by comparison, is AIC, um, quite similar make this easier, a lot of ranks matching, and really only minor replacements uh, in the, in the uh, reversals in the order of relative importance. So it seems that, uh, at least for this national market, the German population and the international AIC population seem to have a high degree of share what, what uh, with Chesterman and Turi we would call shared professional norms. This is what they think is important about the producing quality interpretation and apparently this consensus is pretty extended. We could then of course think how come people uh, share these views uh, to such an extent and the answers would be quite obvious. The training approaches have been pretty uh, solid and pretty well controlled, influenced by AIC. AIC has done a lot of um, work in collaborating with training institutions. Um, uh, there, there's a lot of cohesion among conference interpreter training programs and so uh, we get a lot of socialization of young people into the conference interpreting communities by teachers who are very often practicing conference interpreters and sometimes members of AIC. So they would uh, presumably transmit their own professional norms in their teaching, you know, watch out for sense consistency, keep it logic, finish your sentences, be fluent, be correct. So uh, apparently this kind of interrelation between professional standards and uh, regulating access to the profession uh, by AIC and national associations and training which is very often in, in close cooperation with the professional associations uh, will give us a profession that has pretty 
homogeneous standards. 